Hello, I'm Rachel Hopkin and this is KGOU's How Curious. 70 years ago, in September 1954, the debut novel of an English school teacher was published to almost universal acclaim. His name was William Golding and the book's title was Lord of the Flies. It would go on to sell in the millions and has been adapted multiple times for stage and screen, including a 1963 film version directed by Peter Gluck. Golding's fictional account of the rapid descent into murderous savagery of a group of stranded schoolboys was, he believed, a depiction of how children really would behave in such a situation. By contrast and coincidence, just three months before the novel's publication, a landmark psychological study that has been described as a real-life Lord of the Flies was taking place in an Oklahoma state park. But although the robber's cave experiment was also focused on a bunch of schoolboys, and there certainly were outbreaks of intense animosity among them, it actually offered a very different perspective on human nature from that of Golding. The man behind the experiment was named Musafa Sharif. Gina Perry is a science historian. She's written a book about the robber's cave experiment called The Lost Boys. Lord of the Flies really reflects Golding's view of human nature, which he regards as innately evil. Sharif's view was the opposite, and that is that evil behaviour is manufactured by the groups that we belong to and that we can both make it and dissipate it. So Sharif's view was much more idealistic. Musafa Sharif was born in 1905 in the Turkish province of Izmir. Musafa Sharif grew up in Turkey during his childhood He was actually living in the dying years of the Ottoman Empire. So as a child, he saw an incredible amount of conflict between people who had formerly been neighbours, friends, even relatives, who suddenly, because of rising nationalism and the dissolution of the empire, went from being friends to becoming enemies. And I know that had a profound influence on his thinking So he had a lot of interest in how groups develop animosity towards one another, how prejudice develops, and he was passionate about finding ways to bring about peace between people who are warring. He did not take the view that might have been popular at the time, that there is something damaged in the human psyche that creates this. Marty Gooden is a professor of social psychology. You can understand why this might be popular considering the aftermath of World War II and what we observed with the Nazis. It was easy to conclude that there's something about the German psyche that is damaged in such a way. Sharif challenged all that and questioned the role of the situation, of the circumstances that might lead those individuals, those groups, and those countries to engage in conflict. Sharif's thinking had been influenced by socialist ideals, which in turn led to him being exiled from his homeland. By 1954, he'd been living in the US for some years and was now based at the University of Oklahoma. He'd already gained some renown as a researcher, but what he really wanted to do was provide evidence for his theory that warring groups can be led to harmony given the right conditions. He'd already tried several times, but so far without success. Robber's Cave was really the last ditch effort by Musafa Sharif to get this experiment off the ground successfully to prove his theory. And that meant intervening in lots of ways to engineer the outcome that he wanted. This began with sourcing the right ingredients, i.e. the schoolboys who would be his subjects. Seventy years later, I met up with one of them at his home in Edmond. Ovis Smith has gone by the nickname Smut since he was a kid growing up in Packingtown in Oklahoma City's Meatpacking District. By the way, he got the nickname Smut long before that word had any pornographic connotation. This all started when I was in the third grade, and my teacher told me about this possibility of going on a three-week camping trip and that they were looking for uh, the average kid in the class. What was so average about you? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know, but I was just an all-around 
typical boy, I guess. I played sports, and I probably had average grades and, you know, just everything, I guess. Yes, Smart completely fitted the bill. He was white, working-class, Protestant, not from a broken home, and competitive when it came to sports. Sharif wanted as homogeneous a group as possible, and he tasked his research colleague and protégé, O.J. Harvey, with the job of finding them. In all, 22 boys made the cut. None of them knew one another, nor were any told they'd be taking part in an experiment. Harvey did give their parents some information, but it was partial. Sharif had settled on Robbers Cave State Park as a suitable location for the experiment. As he devised it, it would have three stages, each one lasting about a week. Stage one was in-group formation, and it began even before the boys arrived at the park. Sharif and Harvey had already divided them into two groups. And he bussed them to the Robbers Cave Park on separate days and kept them separate. And the park is so big that it was easy for one group to not be aware that there was another group there. That was deliberate so that each group would, in Sharif's mind, form their own identity early on and feel a sense of loyalty to one another in this very remote place so that when they got the news that there was another group in the park and that they would be competing against one another in a tournament for a valuable prize, it was easier then for the groups to develop a kind of competitive and negative view of the other group. During that first week, each group chose a name for itself. One decided on the Rattlers, the other the Eagles, and each created a group flag. And in each, the boys quickly felt themselves to be part of a loyal band of brothers. Today, June 27, 1954, we have started stage two in this experiment. Uh, stage two is intergroup fiction. Uh, the subjects in each group were told there is going to be a series of contests or a tournament. That's Mustafa Sharif. He's speaking on one of the audio recordings made during the experiment and which are now held in the archive of the Cummings Centre for the History of Psychology at the University of Akron. Stage two of the Robbers Cave experiment was intergroup conflict or friction, and it was engineered to demonstrate Sherry's belief that even though all the boys shared much in common, if they were forced to compete for coveted but scarce resources, they would act badly towards one another. So week two was set up as a series of contests between the two groups. Those on the winning side would be rewarded with attractive prizes. Those on the other would get nothing. In the following archive clip, you can hear two of the researchers disguised as camp counsellors, making absolutely sure the boys knew what was at stake. The winners will win the trophy up there, will win the trophy that you see, and every ball on the winning team will be rewarded with expensive four bladed nine. All of you guys want knives, so we try to we got knives in that. If you go in the tournament, well, you, can, you can have a little knife. There are many things about the robber's cave experiment which would never be allowed now, including giving knives to 10 and 11-year-old boys. Remember that the only way that you can win them is for you to be on the winning side. And fellow, what do you think about that? What do you win? Never won. Never won. Put the winners both in the in the middle. Good deal, boy. Right. All right, do your best. Teamwork. OK. Across the week, the two groups competed in multiple ways, including tug-of-war and ball games, plus cabin inspections. Smut Smith was part of the Rattlers. We wanted to win, but I remember the other team, we would beat them most of the time. But somehow or another, when the credits came up, they got the credits for winning. And all of us were puzzled by all that. This was part of a deliberate strategy to stoke the rivalry, as O.J. Harvey here recalls during a 2006 talk at the University of Akron. We wanted the two groups to be in real close nose-to-nose competition throughout, so we cheated on cabin inspection and a few things. I'd go inspect the cabin and whoever needed a quantum might give them to them, because we didn't want just one group overwhelm the other to start with. The behind-the-scenes manipulation soon paid off. And the Nazis came in, came in very quickly. On the first encounter, they began to assault each other. And this goes on and on and on, and every contact this increased to the point that uh, actual warfare broke out. Now keep in mind, actually, we were trying to, within safety, let the kids do whatever kids would do. So we tried not to intervene. But in any event, they did uh, pretty bad stuff. 
when we came back from the evening meal, our dormitory was wrecked. I mean wrecked. Clothes were everywhere. The beds were turned over, and it was a big mess. Well, our guys were so mad, they were going to go burn their dormitory down. Were you aware that this level of competition, which generated a kind of sense of hostility, was above and beyond what you were used to in other settings? Well, it seemed natural. Everybody fought where I grew up, so that was probably pretty natural to me. <laughs> See how we react? Yeah, we're going to go burn their house down, you know. <laughs> That's how we'll react. <laughs> Fortunately, no dormitories were set ablaze, nor did anyone sink to the homicidal depths of Golding's fictional schoolboys. But although Harvey claimed that the researchers' aim was not to intervene, at least within the bounds of safety, they clearly were intervening throughout the three weeks to ensure that the outcome of each stage conformed to Sharif's theory. It was very important to Sharif that there was a complete breakdown between the two groups. Because the final stage that he'd never been able to reach before was one where he could actually have people who had hated and belittled one another working together in harmony and feeling positive about one another. But he couldn't reach that final stage unless he had war at the stage before. This is stage three, day three. In five minutes, the rattlers and the eagles will come to this mess hall as a superordinate goal. The getting of uh, two films will be proposed to them. The final and perhaps most significant stage of the experiment was conflict resolution. Here's Marty Gooden again. What Sharif understood is that if we're going to bring these kids together, we need to have them doing something that is of mutual interest, that they mutually value, and that can only be satisfied through the collective participation of everyone in the groups. And so he came up with this idea of what are known as superordinate goals. So these are objectives that are mutually desirable, that can only be attained if you have participation from everybody involved. And so they supersede the other interests that they might have as individual group members because everyone needs this. Sharif and his colleagues designed a series of these superordinate goals. The one you heard Sharif just mention concerned a movie night. The boys were allowed to pick a film to watch. They opted for Treasure Island. However, they were then informed that the camp did not have sufficient funds to pay for the film and that both groups would need to chip in with their own money to secure the viewing. After much discussion, they agreed. Gina Perry told me about another one of these goals. The men call them together halfway through the morning and say, we've got a problem. We can't seem to work out what's wrong with the water supply. So the boys form a line running from the water tank following the pipe down the hill and they look for where the problem in the tank might be. Initially, they're working in two separate groups. They find that the pipe has been buried under rocks. They realise that in order to carry away all these rocks, they have to work together as a single group. And... By the end of that exercise, they're trading jokes and that hostility is breaking down. As O.J. Harvey later recalled, by the end of the week, the succession of superordinate goals had clearly had an effect on the boys. The animosity between the two groups had fallen sharply. So it got time to go back to on the city. They went back on the same bus and they got names and addresses and, and so forth. It is a very positive message about the power that we can have to break down prejudice between groups. How realistic that is, I don't know. OJ Harvey was also reflective on this point. I can't stress too much the significance of so far the goal. It's easy to say but hard to do. And uh, we had real trouble trying to figure out how the goals to use. And a lot of people I get letters to say, if I can we apply to a nation now or such well, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I know if we could make a difference, but it's not easy. Marty Gooden, on the other hand, is more optimistic. I would say that the findings, the implications of Sharif's work are definitely being practiced today. Maybe we don't see it as much as we should within government, but international organizations have to rely on cooperation in order to function. 
you know, the COVID vaccine and the ability to be able to address that pandemic could not have happened without global cooperation. Mustafa Sharif died in 1988, O.J. Harvey in 2012. If the two men had been working together today, they'd have had to find very different ways to conduct their inquiry, as there are far stricter rules in place. When Gina Perry was working on her book about the robber's cave experiment some years back, she interviewed a number of men who, as boys, had been the subjects in Sharif's study. None of them knew they'd been part of an experiment until Gina told them, and some still recalled with distress the events of the intergroup conflict stage. However, when I asked Smut Smith if he'd been upset when he found out he'd been used in this way, his response was this. No, not a bit. Not that a bit? Didn't matter to me. I mean, so what? <laughs> you know? I mean, I would have found the conflict set up between the two groups, I know that it would have terrified me. Um, <laughs> it doesn't sound like it had that effect on you. You don't seem to feel like you suffered any ill effects from it. I don't remember being terrified of anything ever. I mean... <laughs> That's probably why you were a good candidate for uh -huh. this <laughs> experiment. I remember it was a fun three-week free trip. And most kids in our neighborhood would never have been able to afford a trip like that. And I just felt real fortunate that I got to go on that. Smut Smith remembering his experience of the Robbers Cave experiment 70 years on. A huge thanks to Smut and all the contributors to this episode. Thanks also to Mauricio Cavallo, Nick Daniels, and Christian Dietmeyer. And to the Doctors Nicholas and Dorothy Cumming Center for the History of Psychology at the University of Akron, which supplied the audio archive material used in this episode, plus some photos taken during the experiment, which you can see on our webpage. Search for KGOU and How Curious. I'm Rachel Hopkin, and this is a KGOU public radio production. The managing editor is Logan Layden, and David Gray composed our theme music. We love getting listeners' suggestions for How Curious subjects. So if you have an Oklahoma-related question or idea, please send it in via curious at kgou.org. The candidates for November are set. I know Donald Trump's type. Between now and Election Day. We are not going back. A campaign season unfolding faster. Kamala Harris is not getting a promotion. Than any in recent history. Make America great again. Follow it all with new episodes every weekday on the NPR Politics Podcast.